Good morning, Vintage Online. If I've never met you before, my name is Montre, and I get to serve as a spiritual formations coordinator here at Vintage Church. If this is your first time joining us, we want you to know that we consider you guys VIPs. So if you're a VIP joining us, text the number on the screen so we can reach out to you and even get you a free gift this week. Guys, if you missed last week, we had an amazing Bible study equip night led by Austin and Erica Carr, two Vintage partners here. And it was amazing, but it's not too late. If you missed out, follow the link below so you can check out that video and other resources related to Deep and Wide. Today is a special Sunday. We're going to be starting a brand new sermon series going through the book of Exodus. Now is the perfect time to join us in, and now is also the perfect time to join a V group. If you're not belonging to a V group at the moment, now is the perfect time to start. A V group is a group of 10 to 20 people that meet throughout the city for gospel transformation, connection, and multiplication. So if you need help finding a V-Group, please comment below so we'd love to reach out and help you in that matter as well. Let's get ready to worship. Yo, what's up, VC Nova? How y'all doing this morning? Listen, we are super excited to worship with you all. Listen, before we sing a song, before we do anything, can we give God thanks for being so faithful and so just, all right? His mercies are new every morning and that's what we're experiencing right now a taste of his grace and mercy so make sure you tag a few friends make sure you share this post make sure you like it do whatever you got to do to let everybody know what we're doing here at vintage church so father thank you for being a man of your word a promise keeper a light and darkness father god a miracle worker and a way maker father you are truly a man of your word so we can trust you even when we can't always feel you or see you father you can say this like this y'all all things are possible when we believe. All things are breakable when we receive Yahweh. You keep your promises. If you said it, we believe it. Come on. If you said it, if you said it, we believe it. Yeah. Whoa. again y'all all things are possible when we believe our chains are breakable when we receive Yahweh you keep your promises if you said it come 
on, y'all. We believe it. Come on. If you said it, oh. If you said it, we believe it. Oh, oh, oh. oh, 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 oh. If you said it, we believe it. Because you're from man. If you said it, we believe it. See, we have this confidence. We have this confidence. Come on, guess what? You finished work, you started. And God, you have never felt. You won't start with me. You're present in every step. Come on, he's patient in every heartache. And God, you have never felt. We have this confidence. You finish what you started, and God, you have never failed. You praise and praise in every step. You patient, patient in every heartache. God, you won't stop with me. If y'all believe that, come on, help us sing it. If you said it, yeah. If you said it, yeah. Come on, y'all. If you said, if you say I'm healed, I'm healed, yeah. If you said it, you said it. If you say I'm free, then I'm free. If you said it.
Father of kindness. Filled me with peace, the giver of mercy, or my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful.
Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Hey, welcome to Vintage Church. If I've never met you before, my name is Pastor Dustin Turner. I serve as the lead pastor of Vintage Church, and I am excited for today. We have a brand new teaching series that we are walking through called Cross Over. And what we are going to be doing is walking through the book of Exodus, the second book in the Old Testament. Every so often, at least once a year, we try to preach through an entire book of the Bible. And we did this a couple of years ago when we started in the book of Hebrews. And what we did is we broke it into chunks and preached it over two years. And so that's what we are going to be doing with the book of Exodus as well. We're going to preach through Exodus uh, two times this year and two more times next year. And that will get us through the entire book of of Exodus. If you know anything about the book of Exodus, it is about crossing over. The people of Israel are in captivity in Egypt. They are enslaved, but God leads them out of captivity going into the promised land. And one of the things that they do is they cross over the Red Sea when they escape from the Egyptian Pharaoh. And so crossover really has this double meaning. Yes, it refers to this reality that we are the, the Israelites are crossing over from slavery into their promised land. But one of the things that we see in the scriptures is this idea of redemption. And this idea of redemption crossing over not just from the Old Testament, but into the New Testament. Yes, the people of Israel were physically enslaved, but here's the reality. Every single one of us are enslaved to this thing called sin. It is disobedience. It is living contrary to the way that God wants us to live. But we can cross over. We can be redeemed. We can cross over from death to life in the person of Jesus. So what we're going to be doing through this series, looking at the book of Exodus, is learning about redemption and what we can learn about ourselves and about what God wants for us in the person of Jesus. I'm really excited to dig into this. You just looked at Exodus chapter 1 verses 1 through 7, and if you're taking notes, here's what I want you to get today. Here's the big idea. God's faithfulness to his promise sets the stage for the fulfillment of his promise. That is, God's faithfulness to his promise sets the stage for the fulfillment of his promise. So from Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, here's what I want us to see first. God has made promises. What we are going to do today is really dig into, not the book of Exodus actually, but the book of Genesis. Why? Because the book of Exodus is actually a sequel to the book of Genesis. Go back and look at verse 1 of Exodus chapter 1. It says, These are the names of the sons of Israel who came back to Egypt with Jacob. That matters... Because you see that exact phrase in Genesis chapter 46. And the reason the author starts that way is he's trying to piece together this fact that Genesis is a prequel and Exodus is a sequel. For those of you who love Star Wars, you get this, right? They're, the original Star Wars was what? Episodes 4 through 6. And I know for some of you, those are the only episodes that exist in the Star Wars universe. And listen... In all reality, episodes four through six can stand alone. But if you want to know the background and you want to learn more about you know, how Darth Vader came to be and how Luke Skywalker came to be and Princess Leia came to be, you understand episodes one through three. You watch those, you understand more about 
the story. And in the same way, if you go back and you understand the story of Genesis, that will help you understand the entirety of Exodus. And so Exodus really is a sequel to the book of of Genesis. Now, the word Exodus comes from the Greek word, which means departure. But again, going back to how Exodus is a sequel to Genesis, the Hebrew name for this book is Shemot. If you're watching at home, say that word with me, Shemot. And what that word means is names. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those first five books of the Bible of the Old Testament, they get their Hebrew name from the first word of the book. And again, that is a tie to Genesis. Now, here's the other tie. If you go and look at verse 7, look again at what verse 7 says in Exodus chapter 1. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, the idea of being fruitful and multiplying would, is, should be very familiar to you. Go back to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1, verses 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them what? Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on earth. We know that that didn't work. Adam and Eve sinned and disobeyed God. God started over with who? Noah. Noah, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, what does God do? God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them what? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But we know that didn't work, so what does God do? He builds a relationship with the family that will become the people of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In in Genesis 35, verse 11, what does God say? God said to them, I am God Almighty. Be what? Fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. So again, this is so important. Exodus is not its own little story that stands alone from the rest of the Old Testament or even the rest of the New Testament, in fact. It is a story of redemption that God began from the very beginning. And so here's my encouragement to you. If you haven't or uh, you haven't done it in a while, I would encourage you to go back and read through this week the book of Genesis And what that's going to do is it's going to prepare you to understand what God is doing in the book of Exodus. Now, what did we say at the very beginning? What God has done is God has made promises. So we see that in the book of Exodus, but what were God's promises? Now again, in order to understand that, we have to go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 12, God encounters, or better, really, Abraham encounters God. Abraham's never met God before, but God comes to Abraham and listen to what happens. Now, the Lord said to Abram, that was his name before God renamed him, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. Important promise there. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. 
Now, here's what I want you to see from Genesis chapter 12. Three very important promises that are going to really come to fruition in the book of Exodus. Three promises that God made to Abraham. Number one, God promised Abraham descendants. In Genesis chapter 12, he has no children. He's 75 years old, but God promises him descendants. Number two, God promised land. He goes from the land of Ur to Canaan, and God promises him that this will be your land. This is where your descendants will settle. And lastly, God promised Abraham blessing, that he would bless Abraham, that he would bless his descendants, and he would bless those who bless Abraham. We're going to look at all three of those blessings. Here's some application that I want you to understand from this story. Relationship is a prerequisite for promises. Now, why is that important? Because God didn't make promises to a complete stranger. I get it, right? Abraham did not know God. But what God did is he built a relationship with Abraham and with his family. Now, later on in the story of Genesis, what God does is he he creates a covenant with Abraham where this isn't just a relationship where they know one another, but this is where there are promises made. And then there are stipulations on those promises that if you keep your end of this agreement and I keep my end of this agreement, this is what's going to happen. So relationships are absolutely essential to these promises. God is not making promises in thin air. He wants a relationship with Abraham, and in turn, because he makes a relationship with Abraham, he will then make a relationship with the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham. Now, here's why this is so important for you and I. God wants a relationship with us as well. There is a reason that God sent his son Jesus to earth. There's a reason Jesus came to earth, put on flesh, lived a perfect sinless life, went to the cross, died for our sins, rose from the grave. It's because God wants to have a relationship with you and I. He wants to have a relationship with humanity. But we have to come on his terms, just as Abraham did. A relationship is a prerequisite for the promises that, yes, God had with Abraham, with the people of Israel, but ultimately, it's a prerequisite for the promises that he has for us. Because all of God's promises are found and fulfilled in the person of Jesus. So we see, number one, that God makes promises. But he not only makes promises, this is where this becomes so important for you and I. Number two, God is faithful to his promises. He's made these promises to Abraham, and he is faithful to his promises. Go back and look at Exodus chapter 1, verses 5, and then verse 7. It says this, All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, but the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. Now, remember... This promise to Abraham started with how many people? One, Abraham. But by the time Abraham's grandson, Jacob, gets to Israel, there are 70 people, which I would say is partly you know, God being faithful to his promise. But then when you keep going, what we learn is that by the time the people of Israel have multiplied, they've been in the land of Egypt for over 400 years, they are now thousands of people. See, God's fulfilled his promise. If we go back and we look at Genesis chapter 15, here is where God makes his covenant with Abraham. And listen to the promise that God makes. It says first, But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house, my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. But don't forget, 
Abraham is old and still does not have a son. So, verse 5, God brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to them, said to him, So shall your offspring be. Verse 6, And Abraham believed the Lord, and God counted it to him as a righteousness. See, what God was saying is, listen, Abraham, I get it. Right now, in this moment, you look at your life. You're an old man. Your wife is old. The, you know, the prospects of you having a child seem very slim. But I am promising you that you will not only have an heir, but look out at the stars. So you see thousands of stars. That's what your descendants are going to be like. God made a promise, and then by the time we get to the book of Exodus, we see that God has been faithful to his promise, that the people of Israel actually are numerous. God did, in fact, give Abraham thousands of descendants. Here's what I want you to see, a point of application for you and I. Trusting God's faithfulness takes faith. It took faith on the part of Abraham to look at his life and say, listen, God, I'm old. People my age, people the age of my wife, we don't typically have kids. But I'm going to trust you. Now, what we know from the story of Abraham is that Abraham has a son named Isaac, the son of promise. And that is a testimony to God's faithfulness. But here's what I want you to get. That's only one son. So it still required faith on Abraham's part to look at Isaac and trust that God would make a nation out of one son. It takes faith to trust God's faithfulness. And you and I, listen, here's the reality. God has made promises to us that will require our faith. But we can trust God because we know God's character. Because God has been faithful in the past, faithful to people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the people of Israel, we can know and trust and believe that God is faithful, that his character is trustworthy. I mean, think about it like this. If you know me, you know that I am a timely person, that I am punctual, that I am on time to things. And so you can trust that if I have an appointment with you or if we're going out somewhere together or we're going to do something and I say, hey, I'm going to be there at this time, you can trust because of my past uh, track record of being on time that I'm going to be on time. God is the same way. Because he has been faithful in the past, we can trust God's promises in the future. We can trust God's promises to us because he's been faithful to us before. So God makes promises. He's faithful to his promises. The last thing that I want you to see is God then fulfills his promises. Now, this is important, right? At the very beginning, I mentioned this idea of crossing over and redemption being a big key in the book of Exodus. And it's not just in the Old Testament, but it's in the New Testament. Here's how we see God fulfill His promises. We've already seen that God's faithful to His promises. Why? Because He promised heirs and He gave Abraham a son, Isaac, and that turned into thousands of descendants. But here's where God fulfills His promises. Because the people of Israel weren't just promised descendants, they were promised land. But where are they when the book of Exodus begins, when the book of Genesis ends? They're in the land of Egypt. It's not their land. They were promised the land of Canaan. And what we are going to see in the book of Exodus is that there is a physical redemption where God brings the people of Israel out of Egypt into Canaan. And that is God fulfilling his promise that the people of Israel would have this land. Again, go back to Genesis chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. Here's the promise that God makes to Abraham. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring, 
I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. That is the land of Israel, the promised land. So God makes this promise to Abraham, this is going to be your land. And in the book of Exodus, we begin to see him fulfill that by taking the people out of Egypt and move them toward the land of Canaan. God fulfills his promise. But here's what I want you to see about the book of Exodus and about this idea of crossing over. There is also a spiritual redemption A spiritual redemption where God takes humanity out of the slavery of sin and into new life. Now, how does God fulfill that? Go back and look at Genesis chapter 12. We read verses 1 through 9. I want to take you to verse 3. And I want you to see this promise that God fulfills. He says, I will bless those who bless you and him who who dishonors you, I will curse. Now look at this part. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, how does that happen? Well, I want to take you to Galatians chapter 3. This is a letter Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, and he was helping them see how Jesus is the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of the promises that God had made to Abraham. Genesis 3, verses 8 through 9. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, that's most of us, non-Jews, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying what? In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. See, what what Paul is getting at is that the promise given to Abraham that all of the nations would be blessed through Abraham finds its fulfillment in Jesus because Jesus was and is a Jew. He was a descendant of Abraham. So because Jesus came... All the nations are blessed. Why? Because salvation is found in Jesus. See, what I want you to understand is that the book of Exodus is really a paradigm. It's a pattern for the idea of redemption. And it finds its fulfillment in the person and the work of Jesus. Think about it like this. Think about movies you watch, right? If you watch a certain genre of movies, there's a formula that those genres follow. So if you like superhero movies or action movies, right? There's a bad guy. The superhero comes in, defeats the bad guy, wins the day. If you like a chick flick movie, chick chick flicks follow a certain formula. This couple falls in love, there's something that happens, there's a breakup, but by the end of the movie, they get back together. Maybe you're into horror movies or slasher movies, right? Where, you know, there's always these elements in those movies that are always the same, right? The, the, ba- the, the, the bad guys after them. And where do they run to? Not outside, not to the ground level. They go upstairs to where you can't escape, and they think they're going to come out alive, right? They, you get to the end of the movie, there is always one single solitary character left, and it's a female, right? All of these movies follow a formula because there's a pattern or there's a paradigm with each genre. And what I want you to see is that redemption is the same. That's what we see is that in Exodus, we see this pattern or paradigm for redemption and we see it come to fruition in fulfillment in the new testament with the person and work of jesus god's promises find their ultimate fulfillment in jesus that is the gospel the life death and resurrection of jesus that jesus is god yet left heaven and came to earth and put on flesh. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He was tempted as we, as we are, yet without sin. But God loved us so much 
that Jesus went to the cross, and on the cross, he died for us. He took on our sins and paid the penalty for those sins. But he didn't stay dead. Jesus rose three days later, defeating sin, death, and hell. And in defeating sin, death, and hell, he offers us life. And see, the Bible says, scriptures say that we have to respond to that message, that when we repent, when we turn away from the way we have been living, the way that's contrary to the way of God, and then when we have faith, when we look to the person of Jesus and say, I trust Jesus, his death and his resurrection to save me, it says we can be saved or we will be saved. And then we publicly confess that faith through baptism going under the water, being buried with Jesus, and then coming up out of the water, being resurrected with Jesus. The Bible says when we repent, believe, and when we're baptized, we're saved. Just as the people of Israel were redeemed out of Egypt, when we respond to the gospel, we are redeemed out of our sin, and we're brought into new life in Jesus. One author describes this paradigm like this. He says, With Israel's exodus out of Egypt through Moses, God has had established a paradigm, the pattern, for understanding the salvation of all of his people, including Israel and the nations through Jesus the Messiah. Over the next several weeks into next year, as we unpack the book of Exodus, we are going to learn a ton about the people of Israel. We're going to learn a ton about Moses, the leader that we know that leads the people out of Egypt. We're going to learn a ton about Egypt. We're going to learn a ton about what God wants for the people of Israel. And we're going to learn a ton about God. But my prayer is that along this journey, we will understand redemption better. That by looking at the people of Israel and the exodus and how God takes the people out and redeems them, we will understand that God has redeemed us in Jesus. That God has made a way to redeem us and take us out of sin into life, into the way that God wants us to live. Because here's the reality. Every single one of us are in need of redemption. That if you do not know Jesus, you are in need of redemption because there is sin or disobedience that separates you from God. Just like the people of Israel, we have been created. We are created to be in relationship with God. But when we trust the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can be redeemed. The story of the Exodus becomes our story. Just as the people of Israel crossed over from Egyptian slavery into freedom in the land, we can cross over from slavery to sin to life in Christ. And so I am so excited to take the next several weeks to journey through the book of Exodus with you and learn more about what redemption means for us. As we go into a time of response, let's take this time now to prepare our hearts and let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for your scriptures. We thank you for the story of Exodus and what it means for us. What we can uncover and what we can unpack about redemption for us. And so I pray, God, that you would use this book and you would use this study to change us. God, for some of us, maybe to recognize our need for redemption and find it in Jesus because we've never done that before. God, for others of us, maybe for the first time, we would come to appreciate our redemption in a real and fresh way. And maybe for all of us, God, we would then be compelled to go and share this message of redemption with our world because we all need it. God, whatever it is, help us respond to you. We love you and we thank you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. 
Well, hey, as we go into this time of response, number one, I want to encourage you to let us know how we can serve you. There's a number on the screen that you're going to see. And if we can serve you in any way, please text us and let us know. Maybe it's just simply for the first time recognizing your need for Jesus. Number one, you can trust Jesus and be redeemed by him right where you're at. The Bible says it's simple to cry out to God, Father, forgive me for my sins and then trust Jesus. I'm trusting Jesus to save me. If that's you, text us and let us know. Maybe you just still have questions about following Jesus and you want those answered. Or maybe you're ready to respond publicly through baptism. Text baptism. Let us know. You have questions or you're ready to set that up. We would love to follow up with you. Maybe you just need prayer. If there's something we can help you with or pray uh, for you or with you about, let us know. Text us those prayer requests. I also want to encourage you to take this time to prepare communion. We are going to take communion together during this series called Crossover. Communion finds its beginnings in Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples. I want to encourage you that in this moment, if you're not a Christian, to simply take this time of communion to reflect on the gift of redemption that God is offering. The Apostle Paul talks to us about communion in 1 Corinthians 11. Here's what he says. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so I would encourage you to take your bread. Your bread symbolizes the body of Christ broken for us. And eat that bread. And then take the juice, the juice symbolizing the blood of Christ shed for us. And then drink the juice. And when we do that, we practice four very important actions. Number one, we remember the death of Jesus upon the cross for our sins. Number two, we reflect on our lives and confess any unconfessed sin. Number three, we thank God for the gift of salvation. And lastly, we maintain the unity of the church by taking communion together. Let's take this time now and respond to Jesus.
need a defender in our lives. We need a defender in our lives. Thank you, Lord. So much better in the way. Jesus.
As I remember it as a child growing up, I remember that I went to five different churches and two youth groups, not really knowing what God was all about. My family, you know, never came together to read and talk about the Bible. At the age of nine, uh, my parents were going through some rough times and the stress that I was dealing with was overwhelming. And um, at night I would lay in bed praying to God for help. And I noticed that a few days later, I felt the negative spirit feeling completely gone. And that's when I knew that Christ uh, was helping me getting through what I was dealing with. Ever since the day that God saved me, God has been by my side, helping me deal with all my situations in life. Knowing what I know now from Pastor uh, Dustin Turner and Matthew Weaver, from their preaching and teachings at Vintage Church, I have a clear understanding of what baptism means and that I am so overdue to show the world that I belong to Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Jackie and I have been changed. Before I knew Jesus, I needed to be saved and I, and I was a sinner. I prayed to Jesus that I can have my sins taken away. Now that I follow Jesus, I want to show people who Jesus is by being kind to them and being baptized. So I want to be baptized because I want to show people who Jesus is and, follow, and um, tell them how to follow him. My name is Revan and I've been changed. Before I knew Jesus, I didn't really think about my actions very much. I didn't think twice about what I was doing. So when I gave my life to Jesus, I had realized that some of the decisions that I was making without thinking were some bad decisions and I wanted to change that, so I gave my life to Jesus to change that. Because of Jesus, now I'm thinking more about how God wants me to think instead of how I think and what I believe. I'm making choices out of what God wants me to say instead of what I want to. I want to be baptized so that I can tell other people about what God has done in my life and to help other people realize that they also need God. My name is Caden and I've been changed. Isn't it amazing to see how God is transforming lives in the life of Ventus Church? If you're interested or have any questions about baptism, please comment below and we'd love to reach out and talk to you. And hey, we want you to know that your faithful giving is changing lives. Um, your giving is allowing several ministries to take place in the life of Ventus Church, so I would encourage you to give today or throughout the week as the Lord leads you. And as we begin this new week, it is our prayer that the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. And may we be empowered to live the gospel, serve the city, and be the church. Have a great week.